So in the last lecture, we discussed um, kinetic molecular theory of gases and the take-home message had to deal with the fact that even though we can treat these molecules of gas as ideal, ideal entities, like little billiard bar balls that have a certain set of properties and there's some factors that drop out and one of the major ones is that the kinetic energy of a gas is proportional to its temperature. And any gas, any two gases at the same temperature have the same kinetic energy. And so this leads to different rates of travel. And so we can express this in terms of Graham's law. Graham's law, which basically says that the molecular weight of one gas divided by the molecular weight of another gas, the square root of which, will be proportional to the velocity of one of the gases, in this case, divided by the velocity of the other. And so we can use this relationship called Graham's law to make molecular weight predictions. We could relate it to how fast gas molecules will diffuse through a sample. Now, one of my favorite questions, and one of my favorite demonstrations is you take a bottle of HCl, you take a bottle of ammonia, and you open them up, and the ammonium and the HCl will react in air and they'll form this sort of white cloud. I might have mentioned it in, in class about these uh, precipitates that happen in the air, these particulates that can form in, under certain conditions. Well, the same thing can, can happen in this case. We can actually sort of systematically set this up. We can take a, a tube of a certain length, a meter, say, and you can have an ammonia flowing in um, into one end and HCl flowing into the other and somewhere along the path they will meet and you can actually predict where they'll meet. Now this seems this is this is one of my favorite chemistry problems but it also seems like one of those problems where there's not enough information to solve the problem. Well what it comes down to is that well one of them is going to be traveling faster than the other. Which one? Well, we know that the lighter gases will travel faster. So ammonia will travel faster. And because it travels faster, we know that it will travel further down the, the pike, so to speak. Whereas the HCl will also be traveling, but at a slower rate. And the question is, where do they actually meet? You can actually predict where they're going to meet based upon our knowledge of the molecular weights. We know that HCl has a certain molecular weight, and we know that ammonia has a certain molecular weight, and so we can use Graham's law to predict how fast the gases go. We can plug these molecular weights into the Graham's law equation and predict the ratio of their velocities. Well, that's all fine and good. We can tell how fast one is going relative to the other, but it doesn't tell them how far have gone. So, luckily for us, though, the velocity, well, velocity, for the velocity of, say, HCl, was equal to the distance the HCl actual travels divided by the time it travels. And we can set up a similar calculation for the ammonia. Now, what's not obvious, though, is that when two gases travel, the place where they meet represents the time at which they've both traveled the same amount of time. They've been traveling. We open them valves at both ends at the same time. They'll meet when their times are equal, the distance they travel. So THCl is equal to TNH3. And so if we plug these equations into our Graham's Law statement, we get a bunch of constants divided by the velocity of HCl, average velocity. And if we plug in these statements into each of these respective components, we get the following. And the temperatures, the, the times drop out because they are constants. They are the same, and two numbers that are being divided by one another are the same become one.
So this leaves us with the ability to solve for the ratio of the distances. The last little caveat is that, well, we know that the distance the ammonia travels plus the distance the HCl travels equals one meter from the problem. Because it equals one meter, these two quantities are equal. Once we have that, we can rearrange and solve each of these equations and plug it into the one above. So we can solve for our molecular weights to get a number, and this gives you the ratio between those distances. So once you solve these equations, you plug them, solve the systems of equations, and you get this ratio, you can plug that into our distance calculation, such that 1.456 times the distance of HCl will equal the distance of the NH3. And you can then plug in the ammonia and the HCl, and you see that the HCl at about the 40 centimeter mark, at about 40 centimeters, the HCl has traveled 40 centimeters. And if you do check the calculation, the ammonia has traveled 60, 60 centimeters, which is in a line with our original assessment that the lighter gas will travel farther. Lighter gas travels 60, in this case, 59.5 centimeters. Again, this is just an, ex an extension of um, Graham's law in a practical setting. So we have these ideal gases bouncing around inside of a container and the long tradition of chemistry telling you one thing and then immediately telling you it's false. We are going to talk about how gases are not ideal. So we talked about this ideal, the ideal gas laws and the ideal gas and the ideal gas was perfect. No intermolecular interactions. I mean, we could we could model it like billiard balls that had no mass, or zero zero volume, um, all this other stuff that we really can't do in reality, but we can approximate for all intents and purposes. So ideal gas laws rely on this idea that you know you take the pressure times the volume, and that will equal nRT, where R represents the universal gas counts and is the number of moles and the temperature. So this quantity PV is, would be related to the number of moles and the temperature. Now that's under the ideal conditions so we can just label these as ideal. All right. So P ideal. But we know that gases are not volumeless. In the perfect world, in the ideal world, the ideal volume would be the volume of the container. Again, there's no, there's no extra. But in the real world, the volume that we actually measure, we're just going to call this measured, as opposed to the volume ideal, would represent our volume of our container minus the volume of the actual molecules themselves. Gas molecules, so we have our container. In the perfect world, those molecules are, they have no, they take up no space. But in reality, they do have a volume. And so the volume we actually measure of the container, well, we have to subtract out the volume of the molecules to represent the, the real volume. So we can think of this ideal, we can think of this ideal pressure as being equal to the real pressure that we measure, 
minus a correction factor that takes into account the number of moles of the molecules, how many there are, n, and the size of those molecules. I'm just call that b. So this term b would use to be to describe the relative size of the molecules. So that is what we could use to discuss our ideal volume. What about pressure? Well, the pressure again represent is represented by these molecules bouncing off one another, smacking into one another. And if there's an attraction between these molecules, the observed pressure will actually be slightly compressed because the molecules are attracted to one another. They're not exerting enough pressure. So we can write another term for the, for the ideal pressure as the real pressure that is artificially lower. So we have to add a correction factor that takes into account the amount of interaction. Unfortunately, the amount of interaction between the molecules also depends on how many there are and how close they are together. The more molecules you have in the same space, the more they're going to be bumping into each other. So we have to throw in a correction factor for both the volume and the number in moles. And it turns out that that particular correction factor, which we're just going to call A, takes into account the number of molecules and the volume. And we have to actually introduce a square term because of the fact that this is a the has to do with the probability of finding them in the same spot. So what this leaves us with is two correction factors that we can plug back into our gas law to represent rather than ideal gas laws, we could look at real gases. So this would be P measure plus A n squared divided by B squared all over B mes minus NB, all equal to nRT. This is called the van der Waals equation. And what it does is it relates the intermolecular forces that we see in gases and the, um, the size of the molecules. It turns out a large number of these constants, A and B, van der Waals constants for a gas, have been tabulated. For the most part, we don't even care about gases because they behave in an ideal fashion. When do gases not behave ideally? Well, looking at this equation, you can see two distinct areas when gases do not behave ideally. The first is when the pressure is very, very large. When the pressure is very, very high, the molecules are forced closer and closer together. Right. This volume component takes place. Under high pressure, gases do not behave ideally. Additionally, under low temperatures, the intermolecular attractions between the gases become more significant. In fact, you can get these compounds to sort of stick together under low temperatures. So gases at their most ideal are when the temperature is high and the pressure is low. Under those situations, the gases have a tendency to behave in an ideal fashion. At high pressures, low temperatures, all bets are off, and the van der Waals factors really come into play. Ideal gases can also can behave in a non-ideal fashion under specific sets of conditions, and we can calculate those values. Usually, though, we don't need to because they're already calculated for us. We're not going to do too many problems where that's the case, but you should be keep in mind that particularly under low temperature, high pressure situations, the gases might not behave ideal. There will be significant deviations from, from what we would expect for an ideal gas.
And that pretty much wraps up gas laws. Lots of equations, lots of practice in the, uh, in the slides for this as well.